A massively warm welcome to everybody joining us on our EchoHelp webinar series today. Uh, today, we are going to be making sense of acronym SOUP, and we are extremely excited because not only do we are we going to be covering some of the acronyms in Wi-Fi, but we also have some product update news to share with you. So first of all, Mac, why don't you give us a formal round of uh, intros for everybody? Absolutely, totally. Thank you very much, Matt. So. It's Matt and Mark, you know, as directors of product marketing and ECSE, joined by Stu and Dale, sales engineers from the beautiful America on the other side of the globe. And we have a special guest. We have Mike with us, that is a product owner of the AI Pro. So, guys, before we continue, if something goes wrong with the AI Pro, you know who to reach to now. Uh, Mike, my friend, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you very much for hosting me, guys. Our pleasure, our pleasure. Okay, let's crack on. Okay, well, um, the theme of the webinar today is that we're going to try and cover as many Wi-Fi acronyms and common technical terms in, in Wi-Fi as possible. And here is a list of the um, acronyms or the terms that we're going to be covering in today's webinar. So uh, we are going to be going through um, the theory side of them in a few slides. And then what we'll do is we'll jump into a live demo in the really nice new version of Echo AI Pro 11.2. And we'll show you some of the acronyms and the, or terms, uh, how you can visualize them and actually see them in the Echohal software. Now, it's uh, if you were to try and search for how many Wi-Fi acronyms or terms there are in the, uh, the Wi-Fi world, you would probably find that there's quite a few. Uh, obviously, we can't cover all of them on today's webinar, but what we have done is we have put together a very comprehensive blog post um, where we counted up earlier and we have 97 different acronyms or common Wi-Fi terms for you with an explanation of each one. So if you would like to head over to that uh, blog post, you can just scan the QR code um, or head to that URL and you can check that out later on after the webinar. Big shout out to Jacob and everyone else at the Echohal marketing team for putting this together. It's a really fantastic resource. I think you're going to love it. So uh, on that note, Mac, why don't you tell us about the first Wi-Fi acronyms we're going to be covering? Okay, Doug. Uh, so let's start with the very basic one. So when you have your access point and you have your clients associated to the access point, this is called a BSS, okay? And BS, it doesn't stand for a BS. It stands for basic service set, okay? So that's BSS standing for basic service set, AP and adjacent, uh, adjacent clients. Uh, move to the next slide. So now, guys, when we, uh, <laughs> Matthew, uh, when we talk about multiple SSIDs, we will still have one access point and probably the same clients or maybe different clients connecting to different SSIDs. Uh, and now each SSID will be identified by a unique MAC address of the radio called the BSSID. So it's BSS ID identifier of the BSS that we've just talked about. Move to the next slide. And then when we have multiple access points that are interconnected somehow for the uh, distribution system, now we call it the extended service set, ES, ESS. So it's not just one IP and clients, it's multiple IPs, multiple clients, multiple SSIDs, multiple BSS IDs per access point, all connected together so we can roam between them. That's the ESS. Great. Uh, so why don't I cover um, a few really important things to know, especially if you're designing wireless networks in, in Echohal. Um, The first one is what's called the inverse square law. And the inverse square law is effectively, if you can see where we have got this point source of energy here. Now, when, what we're looking at is basically each time that we move double the distance away from that original point source of energy, we have one quarter of the power. So what is basically happening to the power of our radio waves as we move at a further, further distance. Now, how do you get to one quarter of the power in Wi-Fi is, well, Wi-Fi, we go up or down by 3 dBs, or if we want to double the power, if we want to half the power, we go down by 3 dBs. So to get to one quarter of the power, we'd actually go down by 6 dBs. So a very high level, that's the inverse square law. And the next one we want to talk, you, talk to you about is what's called the free space path loss. Um, and this obviously keeps in mind the inverse square law. And what we've got here is a 
uh, an access point uh, right here. <clears throat> and then we have got a chart that is showing us some distances as we move away from this access point. And then it's broken down into one meter, two meters, four, eight, and 16. Um, and something else that we just have to talk about is the receiver aperture. So how big is the receiver radio and the sensitivity? Um, but in this example, we will keep it as easy as possible. And we'll just imagine that the uh, transmit power of this radio is configured at zero dBm for all three Wi-Fi radios, 2.4, 5, and 6 gigahertz. In the first one meter distance, as you were to move away from the energy or the access point, um, on 2.4 gigahertz, we're going to have a loss of minus 40 dB in power. So that's what we see here. Okay. In the first one meter distance from the access point, our signal drops to minus 40 dBs on 2.4 gigahertz, uh, minus 47 on 5 gigahertz, and then minus 49 on 6 gigahertz. And then what happens is each time we double the distance, so we go from one meter to two meter, we will have a quarter of that power using the inverse square law. So our transmit, well, our, our power will go down here by 6 dB. So if we just look at the 2.4 gigahertz as an example, we go from uh, minus 40 to minus 46. And then when we go from two meters to four meters, uh, it goes down by another 6 dBs again to minus 52. And then when you go from four meters to eight meters, it goes down by another 6 dBs. So from minus 52 to minus 58. And this is the natural degradation um, energy loss from our access points if they are in complete free space from the energy being emitted from the radio. Uh, but there's something else that we have to take into consideration when we're doing our design, because if we was to open up Ekehau on a project file and just place our access point on the floor plan after we scaled it, uh, everything that we're going to be seeing is the, uh, you know, free space path loss plus the uh, inverse square law that's being used there to calculate the uh, coverage coming from the access point. But what else do we have in our environments that we need to take into consideration? Well, we have materials that's going to cause us what we call attenuation. And attenuation is basically how is this piece of material going to uh, kind of absorb or take in some of the energy from our radio wave. So in this example, uh, it's a drywall and a drywall typically has around a 3 dB attenuation value. So if you remember before on the slide, when we went from uh, four meters to eight meters on two uh, and looking at the 2.4 gigahertz, we go from minus 52 dBs to minus 58. But when we introduce this wall now, because we have a 3 dB of attenuation, it doesn't go from minus 52 to minus 58 now, it actually goes to minus 61. So when you draw your walls and attenuation values in Ekehal, we look at that free space path loss calculations plus subtraction of any type of attenuation walls effectively that you draw. And we have got, uh, many ways that we could potentially measure some RF attenuation, but Mac, why don't you talk us through it? Of course, uh, but before we continue, we have good questions about the units from David asking uh, distance. Is it kilometers, meters, or anything else? And the answer is, it doesn't matter. So every time you double the distance, you quarter the power. If it's from one centimeter to two centimeters, from one meter to two meters, from one kilometer to two kilometer, you quarter the power carried by, by a signal, okay? So it doesn't matter. And then F stands for frequency and it's in Wi-Fi always set in megahertz, okay? Uh, cool. Uh, so now Matthew has uh, discussed what happens when the wall is introduced, uh, that we have extra attenuation of this wall on the free space path loss on top of a free space path loss, and now how to measure attenuation with the walls. And there are two uh, methods. One method is lame because it's old school and it's manual and it's boring and it's time consuming, but it's crucial to understand how it works in order to, to understand how it works. That makes sense, doesn't it? So when you want to measure the attenuation of the wall, you have your wall, right? And the wall is whatever, 20 centimeters thick. Now, if you want to know how heavily it absorbs the Wi-Fi signal, you need to have a Wi-Fi signal in the air. And where do you have this Wi-Fi signal from? 
you put an access point and the access point can be a real access point connected to the battery. It can be an existing access point uh, far away from the wall. It can be your mobile device in a hotspot mode and you put it 10 meters away from the, from the wall, okay? Uh, 20 meters away from the wall, 50 meters, it's fine. Five meters, it's stretching it a little bit and less than that is too close to the wall. Do you know why placing an access point too close to the wall would be probably a mistake when you measure the attenuation of the wall by, che by checking the RSSI on both sides of the wall? Based on what Matthew was showing or is showing now on the screen, you can see that the signal depreciation, the loss of energy over the first few meters is very, very fast. Okay, And then after like four meters, six meters, it starts to become quite linear okay so it's no longer it's no longer that massive just to give you a, an example when there is an access point and i have a phone one meter from the ap i move it 20 centimeters back and forth and the signal will fluctuate a lot plus minus 20 30 dbs easily if i have an access point and i have a phone on a desk and they are one meter apart even if i don't move anything the rssi the received signal strength indicator the measured signal strength will fluctuate because the signal, uh, the distance is so little, so tiny, small fluctuations in the environment, you know, whatever happens in the air, RSSI will fluctuate a lot. But now when I move my phone 10 meters farther away from the access point, it will no longer fluctuate that much, maybe plus minus one dB here and there. And now we are measuring the attenuation of the wall. AP far away, I measure the RSSI on one side of the wall, then I go to the other side of the wall and this distance on the other side of the wall, like, you know, 20 centimeters, it doesn't really matter because we are 10 meters away from the wall. And I note down the average RSSI on both sides of the wall. And then I detract one from the other. And then I will have my, my 3 dBs, for example. So if it was minus 36 on one side, minus 39 on the other side, we know that we have 3 dBs of attenuation. So that was the lame method of doing it. And that's because of we, we can do it automatically now. So if you have Wi-Fi signal, existing Wi-Fi signal, and if you go to the site with your sidekick and do a quick survey, survey is like just walk around with your sidekick and a mobile phone or a tablet or a laptop, whatever. You have enough data for the Ekaha AI Pro to automatically calibrate your walls across your building, which is powerful. It's more accurate. It's faster and it's beautiful. So that's, that's the new method. And we would encourage you to, to do so. Okay, and now here, uh, I think we've had a question about if we have walls of attenuation values predefined somewhere. And of course we do. So you will see in Echo How AI Pro that we have tons of walls. This is just the example of like a drywall 3 dBs, you know, like a brick wall, typically 10 dBs. Uh, we have concrete walls, typically 12 dBs. These are typical values of typical walls, but not all walls are typical. So it's always best practice to measure attenuation of your walls and we would use automatic wall calibration uh, tool that we have in Ekahau AI Pro. Yep, we were we can um we can show that uh, in another demo another time. Um but really great explanation there Mac, thank you so much. And uh, another term that we talk about in Wi-Fi all the time is primary coverage or receive signal strength indicator. Um but when you're looking at the, your heat maps in Echo, whether it's a design file or whether it's a validation file, when you're looking at the signal strength, what we are looking at is effectively the signal strength from the strongest access point. So in, in this example here, we've got three access points, AP1, AP2, and AP3. And the psychic is hearing those uh, access points at three different values. So AP1, it can hear it at minus 68 dBm, uh, AP2 at minus 59 AP3 at minus 72. So the strongest signal is the one that is closest to zero. So that's going to be AP2 at minus 59 dBm. So that's the primary signal. So when you're looking at that in Echohau, when we're looking at our signal strength, we're looking at the strongest signal from the access point. And if you are looking at a heat map inside of Echohau, you'll notice that we have um, a visualization legend where it defines um, the first kind of section in green the next section in gray, then the last section in white. And so what are these and how do we refer to them? So we refer to them as our, our want area, our don't want area, and our don't care area. Well, why is the green our want area? The green is our want area because this is where our signal level is to a minimum threshold that we have defined that the Wi-Fi is going to work and we're going to be able to use our client devices uh, on 
uh, connected to this access point and be able to do the applications that we wish them to do. Make voice calls, video calls, send and, send and receive emails, whatever we predefined as our uh, signal threshold for our pr primary coverage there and it's at neg 67 because that's typically the minimum that we would need to be able to make and maintain voice or video calls so what is that gray area then the gray area is the signal that is between our threshold that we have set that we wanted so in this example minus 67 to minus 85 um, and why do we have that gray area because if you have more than one access point sharing the same channel in your design or your validation in your environment um, and they can hear each other at minus 85 dBm or greater, they will have to share the channel if they are on the same channel. So this means that we could have some uh, channel contention and they have to take it in turns to access the medium. And also if your client device is associated to the access point in that don't want area, then it means that they will probably not be able to make or maintain the application that we would wish them to voice or video so it's not a great signal and we also have to share access to the medium with another device on that same channel so then finally the don't care threshold is the threshold for we don't care because if we hear another access point or device transmitting lower than that we just ignore them and send our data anyway um, and then another visualization we like to look at a lot in echo is the secondary coverage um, so again psychic three AP examples. Um, but this time now, when you're looking at your secondary signal strength, we're not looking at the signal strength from the strongest access point in the environment. We're looking at the access point with the second strongest signal. And why do we need secondary coverage? Uh, we need secondary coverage for two main reasons. Number one being for redundancy. If we was to have an access point fail in a certain area of the environment, is there another access point near enough nearby that could provide sufficient coverage if that access point was to have a failure? And then number two, the second reason is for uh, roaming. Can our client devices discover other access points to go in a uh, roam and associate to? Can our access points build their neighbor reports to be able to inform our client devices of the best next uh, access points are their neighbors to go and uh, roam and connect to to improve those roaming times so to build a really uh, efficient and high performing wireless network we don't just need to rely on primary coverage we also need to have secondary coverage so what i'm going to do now is i'm going to hand over to mac because mac is going to give you a really great demo of um, some of those acronyms that we've just covered but in our fancy beautiful new echo ai pro 11.2 we're seeing your chrome by the way mac there we go. You sure? Yep. <laughs> uh, I will be going to the Chrome later. So, chaps, here we have a beautiful Agahau AI Pro in a light mode. And we have our Helsinki office. And we'll talk about the primary and secondary coverage. So let's, let's do just that. We have walls that are drawn. Uh, we have actually more things that are drawn, but I don't, I don't show them. Uh, so... We have all the names and attenuation areas and inclusion areas. So when I like enable it, you will see that I have it drawn, but I will just, you know, not show that for, uh, for cleaner and clearer view of the AI Pro. So first of all, let's drop an access point and I will drop an AP that is, okay, there's something obscure in my screen there. Uh, 9166. I will drop it, whatever, let's say in the meeting room. And now I'm looking at the uh, 5 gigahertz primary signal strength, and we can see what this access point covers, right? Now, I would like to bring your attention to the legend on the right hand side, where it shows the colorful, beautiful things, and then the gray stuff and then the white stuff. Now, look at that. The white stuff, it means that there is nothing, like here. The gray stuff, we have the gray coverage here and there, and the colorful is anything that is below the next 67 or above the next 67 uh, dBm uh, threshold. When I click on the legend, I can set it up however I want, but this is based on the requirement called the ECHA best practices. That is a default environment, coverage requirement, okay? If you want to click around and see the coverage requirements, you can go to project coverage requirements, and this is our default requirement that is suitable for most environments okay so we want to have primary and secondary signal strength of next 67 across five and six and we don't care about 2.4 2.4 best effort band okay 
So that's where the legend comes from. Now, what do you think would be the second W signal strength here? Do you think we'll have any now? Okay, so we won't have any second W signal strength. When I move to it, we need the second AP. Yeah, Jacob, well done. <laughs> uh, so I will go back to drawing APs and let me put it, whatever, here in the game room. Do we have any secondary coverage there? Not too much, right? It's still it's still gray everywhere. It's because these access points, they are quite far away from each other. But now if I drop an access point, let's say in this meeting room here, I start to see some secondary coverage, okay? That's where when I have the primary coverage that is best around the access point, now this is the second best coverage. So now it pretty much doesn't exist across entire office, but when I have it like in between the access points, it does. But let me start dropping more access points onto the floor plan. And look, I have more and more. So this secondary coverage here is like a sum of the coverage in between these two access points, the secondary best coverage from in between these two access points. Same here in between these two access points. I will continue placing access points. And look, I'm I'm getting better and better secondary coverage. This is the development area. So I will give them an access point there as well. This is a breakout area. I probably would place an access point here, but I will put it, I will put it somewhere here. I want to have a transition access point. So when you have clients moving through this tiny little corridor, I want them to to, to row between these two access points quite reliably. So I will place it probably somewhere, somewhere here. Now I will check the coverage from this access point, like the main the primary coverage. So I can see that this covers this. This covers that. This means that these two access points, they can see each other. They can hear each other, okay? So that means that I will be able to use 802.11k neighbor list to discover this APs fast when I move around the floor. But guys, this is primary and secondary coverage. Look, primary is very good. Secondary coverage is, is good, but it's not everywhere. Now tell me, is that a problem that I don't have a secondary coverage in the corner of this meeting room? or in the corner of this room, or in the corner of this room. Okay, Derek says that it's not a problem. Abdul, not a problem. Okay, so if you present it to the client and the client asks, okay, how is the network doing? Let me actually calculate the channels first before I show you anything else. Uh, disable unnecessary radius, no. Uh, calculating for 1, 6, and 11, this is fine. All defaults, I'm leaving it on all defaults. So I'm allowing Ekahal AI Pro to calculate channels for me. So I'm hitting 100% of my requirements specified as part of the ECHO Hub best practices coverage requirements. Now, when I still ask ECHO Hub AI Pro, what is the network health? Look at that. This shows as red. So when you show that to your clients, they, they will start asking questions. And we have to be in a position to answer those questions reliably. And answer to this question is, you don't care about that stuff. You don't care about it at all. Secondary signal strength is required for AP redundancy. Okay, that's one of the reasons. And another reason, very important one, is the roaming. So if you are getting close to the cell edge from the perspective of your client and you are connected to a particular access point, you always want to have a very good alternative to associate to. And this very good alternative will be defined by the secondary coverage. Okay, and you need to have that everywhere where you expect to be roaming around the floor and you won't be roaming in the meeting room, right? You go there, you will be connected to this AP. You don't need to roam there. So that's that's not a problem at all. Okay, hey, so Matt. these are, yes. Um, there's a few people asking what, um, what transmit power are you using for the uh, access points? And one of the acronyms we had earlier was uh, EIRP. So I wonder if you could maybe cover both at the same time. Totally. Uh, so let's answer this question. Very good question. So guys, you can see the transmitting power levels. I haven't changed anything. So I am using defaults, which is 8 dBm on 2.4 and, and 14 dBm on 5 and 6. Now, this is the configured radio transmitting power. Okay, so when I, let's say, click on the access point and I go into more settings, edit this access point, I can see, let's focus on, let's say, 5 gigahertz here. We have 14 dBm transmitting power level set, but the EIRP, that's one of the uh, special acronyms as well that is used uh, very, very frequently. So we need to understand what it means. EIRP, it stands for the radiated power. And this radiated power is 
Mafi is smiling because I never remember <laughs> uh, the acronym. Even like mm. my master thesis, it was included there quite a lot, many times. I will never remember that. So it's can anyone uh, can anyone help Mac out in the chat? What what it does E I R P stand for? Does anyone remember it from the slide earlier? Before I before I reveal it, we'll give everyone a second to just come on, guys, help me out. Yeah, help Mac out. He's he's forgotten. There we go. Effectifies the traffic. Okay, effective hey. equivalent. Yeah. Okay, so that's exactly what happens in my head. I will never remember <laughs> if it's effective, equivalent, or whatever else. So Matthew, what is it? <laughs> ah, well, I think that if you really want to know, we have a fantastic blog that could tell you. But also, um, I think it is the uh, yeah, effective isotropic radiate power or equivalent isotropic radiate power. I wonder. Oh, oh, oh. Okay. Uh, yeah. whatever. So guys, uh, transmitting power. And EIRP, there are two different things. So transmitting power is the power set on your radio. And EIRP is the radiated power that takes under consideration the transmitting power level from your radio and passive antenna gain or loss. Okay, Smartphones, for example, like the zigzag antennas, they will have a negative gain. Uh, bigger antennas, they will have higher gain. Directional antennas, they will have you know a lot of gain into a certain direction. Uh, high gain omnidirectional access points or antennas they will be like you know uh, around the antenna coverage pattern but flatter and wider so the point is that you have perfect sphere like a perfect sphere and this perfect sphere has no gain in any direction if the sphere is like extended into certain direction like all around flatter wider or more into certain direction then we have passive gain and EIRP, it takes this passive gain into consideration. So let's take a look. We are using Cisco 9166 to make it a little bit funnier. Let's use an access point with a directional antenna. So I will use a Cisco AP with 9103, okay? Because it's a popular antenna. I will drop it anywhere. This is just to, to show you guys. And now I will go into that AP, edit it. And look, we have a 14 dBm transmitting power level on five gigahertz, but the EIRP is 20. 20 point something, 20 dBm. But now when I go to a data sheet of that antenna, I can see that on five gigahertz, we have six dBi. I stands for isotropic, this perfect spherical theoretical antenna. We have six dBi gain in a certain direction. And looking, just looking at the uh, pattern from the antenna, I can see that this antenna shoots like in front of itself. Okay, so six dBi gain plus 14 dBm transmitting power level equals around 20 dBm EIRP, okay? I hope that that's it. I hope that it makes sense. It can be a little bit more complex, but let's keep it simple. So passive antenna gain plus transmitting power level. Okay, dog. Uh, so this is pretty much everything that I wanted to show you. A very quick bonus talk. Look at that. I have my access point here in the corridor because we still have like, it's a good time. Uh, what happens if I place this access points, not like here, I placed here deliberately. I wanted these two access points to hear each other. But also what I didn't want to have is clients, like when I put it here, dropping off behind the corner. So in this office, it's not a massive issue because this is not a concrete segment. But in most offices, you will have like a massive concrete segment in the middle that you will go around, okay? So if my walls, these dry walls, these green dry walls were a little bit heavier when it comes to attenuation, maybe not 3 dBs, maybe like, you know, 12 or 13 dBs like a normal concrete pulse would be. Look what happens. You are associated with this AP, you move down the corridor, you move down the corridor, you have really, really good strong signal strength, and then one step to your right and you drop off from the Wi-Fi network. There is no signal at all behind heavy attenuator. So be very careful with that stuff. So that's the primary coverage where it really matters combined with secondary coverage. And that is everything for this quick demo. Amazing demo, man. Thank you so much for that. Let me uh, get Thank the you. slide back going. Um, so that was the demo. Um, okay, so another Wi-Fi acronym, very popular one is SNR, which stands for signal to noise ratio. Uh, so what this is, is effectively in Wi-Fi, we have something that is called a noise floor, which is 
this scary white stuff around here, which in this example is around minus 95 dBm. Um, and then what we have is our RSSI, which is our received signal strength indicator. So our client devices, how do they receive the signal? So if we was to receive the signal strength at minus 50 dBm, and our noise floor is at minus 95 dBm, you just work out that difference. So between minus 50 to minus 95 is 45. So we would, in this example, have a SNR value of 45 dBs. Uh, the higher the SNR value, the better quality of the signal, the uh, more complex modulation scheme we'll be able to use, and the faster data rates effectively. Okay, um, something else we have to talk about in Wi-Fi is, is channels and what we refer to as co-channel interference. So I'll just be using the 2.4 gigahertz band for this example, but it's the near enough the similar or the same for in the 5 and 6 gigahertz frequency band as well. So in this example, we've got three uh, radios broadcasting, one on channel 1, uh, one on channel 6, and one on channel 11. And in this scenario, we have got no co-channel interference or adjacent channel interference at all. So this means that any of our access points and the client devices associated on this channel, they'd be able to just communicate with each other um, and share the channel and not have to worry about any channel interference from a nearby access point. But what would happen if in the same scenario, we didn't have the other access points on channels one and channel 11, they are both on channel six. Well, what this would mean is that we would have a CCI value, co-channel interference of three, because we have got three radios now sharing the same channel instead of using uh, some of the other available channels. And the more devices that you have sharing the same channel uh, means the less chance of your devices being able to uh, access the medium and be able to transmit and receive their data. Um, so we want to try and avoid co-channel interference as much as possible. Okay. And then data rates. Data rates are really important when it comes to uh, Wi-Fi, but Mac is going to talk you through that. And then what I'll do is I'll give you a nice demonstration in uh, Echo How AI Pro. Okay, Tav. So very quickly, this is very important. So data rates, there are three different types of data rates that you can specify in your network. Basic data rates, so these are data rates that are required for your clients to even associate to the Wi-Fi network. If they don't support data rates that are set as basic, you won't be able to connect to that particular Wi-Fi network. Then supported rates, these are the rates that the client can use if it wants to, but it doesn't have to. Example, you have basic data rates set to 12 megs per second, and then all upper rates are enabled or supported. It means that your device, in most cases, will be sitting on like the way higher data rates than, than 12 megs per second, but it will have to support 12. And we'll come back to basic a little bit more in a sec. And then disabled data rates are the rates that you cannot use under any circumstance. They are disabled. So let's talk about disabled first. If you have clients, like beautiful new clients, and you don't want to support ugly, slow, old clients, the best thing that you can do is to disable data rates that are lower than 11 megs per second or lower than 12, including 11. That will scratch all the clients that are 802.11b, for example. They won't be able to connect the network anymore, and that's quite important. Now, let's spend a second talking about the basic data rates. This is the most important stuff. Because if you set your basic data rates to the lowest available values, which in modern networks are 2 megs per second on 2.4 and 6 megs per second on 5 and 6 gigs, all the management and control traffic, all of it, or most of it, will be exchanged at the lowest available basic data rates that you set. Okay. So, for example, if you have quite a lot of contention in your network, a lot of radios on the same channel, and your network might be perfect, but your neighbors, they contribute to a lot of CCI, same channel interference, same channel overlapping with your access points, and you all have low data rates enabled, like basic data rates enabled, then all the beacons or management frames, control frames, or most of them will be exchanged at this low basic data rates. That, combined with a lot of SSIDs, can mean that even without any client traffic, like a data traffic, you will have massively oversaturated Wi-Fi networks with 
20, 30, 50% channel utilization, or if you go crazy with the number of SSIDs and a lot of SCCI, it might be even 100% without the client traffic in your network. So be careful with it. Now, the golden rules to set up basic data rates are today, under any circumstance, I probably wouldn't go lower than 12 megabits per second. In more modern networks, even a little bit more complicated ones, even in the warehouses, typically, you can safely set it to 24 megs per second. And this pretty much gets rid of the management and control overhead in your network when it comes to the percentage that contributes to the airtime utilization. So again, 12 megs, you can't go wrong with that. 24, great in most situations. Never or almost never use two and six megs per second because it's a little bit too slow. And a very quick thing to, to note that is very important, even if you reduce your, uh, your data rate, so let's say you said not to use anything lower than 12, it still doesn't really shrink your coverage area, meaning that your CCI channel interference will still be high if you have network that is not designed correctly. Data rates, they do not reduce same channel interference, CCI. Cool. So uh, let me give you a very quick demo in Echo AI Pro, how we can uh, visualize some of those acronyms that we were just discussing. Uh, so what I have got here is a predictive model built in Echo AI Pro. And if I just uh, zoom in a little bit, you can see that I've got some of my AP icons placed here. Um, so if I click on one access point, we can see the coverage coming from this AP. But one thing that you will notice when we're looking at our AP icons is they have numbers next to them. Okay, so this number here is telling me that the 2.4 gigahertz radio is using channel one, the five gigahertz radio is using channel 36, and then my six gigahertz radio is using channel one. But when you see the at symbol followed by another number, it's telling you how wide the channel uh, that it is using. So it's using channel one at 80 megahertz wide. Okay, so how can we visualize uh, co-channel interference to start with? So at the moment, I'm on the signal strength visualization, but if I change to our channel interference view, we can now see that everything has unfortunately gone gray. This means that we have got lots of devices all sharing the same channel in the environment, which they all are at the moment. <clears throat> so there's a couple of ways that we can change the channel of the access points. If I just select this one here, and we'll just look at the five gigahertz for now, what I can actually do is on my access point selection here, I can just click on where it says channel 36 and I can change that to be channel 40. And that's going to change that access point to now be on channel 40. And what you can see in this bottom left hand corner, it starts to go a little bit green. And if I was to change this access point, I can select it. I could go to right click, edit access point. And if I come to the five gigahertz radio, which is this radio two, what I can do is I can change it to be another channel on five gigahertz. So channel 44 now, and then just hit close. And then when I click off, what we'll see is there is more and more green starting to creep in because we have no channel interference in this section because these APs are no longer sharing the same channel, but all of the other access points, they still are. And now it didn't take me too much time to change the channel of those couple of access points, but I've actually got 18 access points on this floor. So rather than do it one by one and individually, what I would like to do is just use our channel planner, which is an awesome feature. I can click on the channel planner tool. And then we have our configuration here where I can choose uh, what channels I would like to use. So on 2.4 gigahertz, I would typically always stick with one, six and 11 on five gigahertz. I've excluded a few channels because perhaps maybe this site is affected by uh, weather radar or DFS. Um, so I want to not pick some of the channels to use. I can choose the bandwidth. So 20, 40 or 80 or even 160 megahertz wide for five gigahertz. And on six gigahertz as well, we can choose which channels we would like to use and which channel bandwidth. So if I'm happy with that, all I do is I simply hit create. And what Echo is going to do is going to look at the configuration of all of our channels for us and come up with a uh, nice new channel plan. And we can see up at the top here that on five gigahertz, we went from a 12% passing to 100% passing, and we have no co channel interference anymore. But ah, interesting, on six gigahertz, we only have a 74% pass rate. So if I click on the six gigahertz visualization down here, what we're gonna see is we can see some grays now. So 
what this basically means, if I wanted to use 80 megahertz wide channels in uh, this environment, and let's say it's in the U e UK, where I only get access to the 500 megahertz of spectrum, I might want to consider using uh, a smaller channel width so I don't have any uh, contention. So what I can do now is run the channel planner again. And instead of using an 80 megahertz wide channel, I will try a 40 megahertz wide channel and then just create and then just go over the uh, channel planner again. And let's see if we can make a 40 megahertz wide channel plan work for six gigahertz in this environment. And if we take a look at that now, how did we do on six gigahertz? we have now got no channel interference on six gigahertz as well, which is really good to see that we can have a uh, contention-free wireless network using a 40 megahertz wide channel. Um, the next thing I wanted to show you is the signal to noise ratio. So if I change my visualization here from the channel interference to signal to noise ratio, what I can do is I can visualize my SNR value for my environment. And if I go to the inspect tab, which is just up here, what I can do is I can actually select a individual location on the floor plan and it's going to show me the SNR values of that exact location where I am currently clicking on the map and it also tells me the uh, data rate that we are using so the uh, minimum requirement is 24 meg but in this scenario here we can actually do up to 573 megs and if I change now from 5 to 6 gigahertz what you'll notice is actually we can do 1,147 megabits per second in this location. Wonder why that is? Anyone anyone know why it's uh, so much faster on six gigahertz compared to five gigahertz? Let me know in the chat if you uh, if you know what it is. Channel width. Yes, exactly. Well done, very good. So the channel width on six gigahertz is using 40 megahertz, whereas five gigahertz is using 20 megahertz. When we're using wider channels, we're able to achieve a faster data rate. So we can uh, transmit our Wi-Fi frames faster um, by using a wider channel. So um, that's why we see that difference there between five and six gigahertz. So um, that was a few ways that we can visualize uh, this in Echohow AI Pro. So what I'll do is I'll just come back to uh, sharing the slides as we are at the top of the hour. Here we go. And just to wrap up um, again, to let everybody know that uh, if you would like to see our blog where we've covered a lot more of the Wi-Fi acronyms and the common terms, then uh, please go ahead and jump to that URL and check out that blog. It's very, very comprehensive. Um, so yeah, go take a look at that and a, yeah, a kind of a big thank you from us. We can take a, a few questions now, if anyone would like to stay on for an extra few minutes, we'll do a, a live Q and a session from some of the questions that have been coming in, in the chat and the Q and a session. So I can see Dale has now returned back to us. I'm back. So, you know, during today's call, we, um, highlighted some of the new features that we expect to, or that users can expect to see in 11.2 light mode, AP distances, um, viewing adjacent floor APs, um, new fast wall drawing. So now the anticipation is there and people are wondering when will 11.2 be available? Great question. Mike, would you like to answer this one? Sure, uh, it will be available during next week. There you go. Very, very soon then. So not, not too long to wait, just next week and you'll be able to start drawing those walls really fast. Perfect. And then it seems like uh, people are pretty interested and fond of the uh, keyboard shortcuts and wonder where they can find some of those shortcuts. So I'm going to post into the chat. Um, I believe Mike posted there um, the keyboard sh shortcuts and he said it will be updated when after 11.2 is released. So there it is reposted into the chat. Um, and then also there were questions around automatic wall calibration, which Matt, I believe, um, you mentioned maybe in a future demo, we can go over that in more detail, but Julian, I believe, or Jacob did post something. So I'm going to repost that, um, a video, a link specifically around automatic wall calibration and that feature. 
yeah so uh, absolutely our next webinar that we will do we will include a demo of um using the auto wall calibration and how impactful it can be for speeding up your process on site and for getting your designs perfectly accurate so in the, in the next webinar that we do in a couple of weeks time we'll make sure we include a uh, a nice fresh demo of the auto wall calibration for everybody to see yep and we now guys use that uh, automatic wall calibration for every single design that we do it's extremely powerful yeah i love it okay any other questions this really is what i had noted so far oh that's fine we've answered just 40 questions in q a in life <laughs> Okay, well, if we um if we don't have any other uh, questions to answer, we can wrap up the webinar today. Just want to say a massive thank you to our special guest Mike for doing an awesome demo of the new version of Echo AI Pro 11.2 that's going to be released during next week. It's his first time on the show. He did an amazing job presenting the uh, new features. I think are going to be extremely well received by our users. Uh, we're loving using them, so I'm sure everybody everybody else will and um of course a big thank you to dale and Stu for helping us out mac everyone else at the echo marketing team and of course most importantly you guys and girls for joining us on the webinar we uh we love having you here and doing these webinars together um and thank you so much we will see you all on the next one yeah. in a few weeks thank you guys time. oh we forgot to mention one more feature like uh, the side panel has a new arrow not in the middle it's on the top and it's extremely good looking so take a look at that as well when you have a chance next week and you can okay. click anywhere you want you don't need to click on the on this tiny thing so beautiful just a pro tip <laughs> <laughs> all right cool all hey right guys. everybody take care thank you so much see you soon. thanks